In 2004, there was a biopic of the singer Bobby Darren, and I, I really liked the film. Uh, it's not my favorite film, so it's probably my favorite biopic of all time. I liked it so much, I even have the uh, CD soundtrack right here. And the soundtrack is, is, is beautiful. There's just kind of one problem with it now. It was written, produced, directed, and starring Kevin Spacey. Now, of course, this is way before the allegations came out. Spacey kind of tanked his career in response. But on reflection, does that hurt the film? And if I was to look at this objectively, I'd probably say no. I still think the movie is a beautifully shot film. It's well made. The acting is incredibly good. It's one of those great biopics that kind of acknowledges that it's a work of fiction. It even has a kind of a, an in-text thing of kind of hand waves, the fact that Kevin Spacey is playing Bobby Darren through essentially his late teenage period all the way till his death. Essentially, Spacey's Bobby Darren is the narrator. And it goes to the trial and tribulations. It, it's not afraid to show that Bobby Darren himself is a complicated character and that he has... See, a lot of these things now seem really bad in retrospect. You go, wow, you know, maybe Bobby Darren was a bit of a shit. Well, there is the whole spousal thing. Uh, I'm conflicted because I really do like this movie. I think Kevin Spacey is a good actor, but he's shown himself to kind of be a bit of a monster. And that is going to be what we're talking about. So how do we proceed? Okay, let's... Let's go in a bit of definition here. Um, what I'm referring to as art, I'm referring to the broad spectrum, not specifically art, which is a common thing. This is why people get tripped up when they say, oh, video games can't be art, comic books can't be art, movies can't be art. Those arguments have always been terrible. Artists have been constantly challenging that. Postmodernism is infamous for that. We've lost that disconnect between the artists and the audience that used to exist. We never used to know too much about a lot of the artists behind the things we make for good and bad reasons. Again, if something is beautiful, but you know it's made by a terrible person, how does that work? In art in the purest sense, you're supposed to say, no, it's, it's still supposed to be taken as a piece. The other way is to look at all the background stuff. What is the art telling us about the artist and the audience? Art is also sometimes a reflection of the audience. Um, okay, when I'm getting tangent -y. you get why this is a complex idea. So let's narrow it down a bit. When we're talking about an artist, we have got to look at the medium itself. Typically, you want to think of an artist as the individual creative force, and that's not necessarily true. Yes, there's still plenty of mediums that where the one person is the central core figure. That makes things a lot easier. For example, writing tends to be a one person show. That doesn't disclude the idea of editors. The editors should be used to make things better. But then of course you're getting into the politics of publishing and all the other stuff. Well, traditionally a novel is one person's creative output in book form. Same with painting. We typically see a painting and we think of a painter we don't think of about the other things like the, the subject themselves, typically. I mean, art critics and stuff do, they tend to look at all the different factors, but you typically think this is a creation of one person. This is where other mediums start to get a bit confusing. Monday media is not created in a vacuum. And that's not just going into the postmodern stuff. We literally have no one real core person anymore. A TV shows, video games, movies, all that stuff have a lot of creative forces behind the one product. Sure, a director or the writer or producers or even sometimes the main actors have this, the core focus of that creative art, but it's, it's very rarely just one person. Even a terrible piece of art will have many people behind it, like a bad movie Let's face it, some bad movies are saved because sometimes the cast is just kind of really good or sometimes really kind of bad, and that gives you some enjoyment out of it. Martin Scorsese probably couldn't direct The Room with that script. I mean, you could make it a better looking film, but the dialogue and everything, you can't polish that much of a turd. This is what we're getting at. Tongue Rise is a piece of shit. 
But Greg Sestero is a really cool guy and you got that nice balance. So you kind of still can like the room and the cast are just doing their job. It's sad that they kind of got screwed in the process, you know, by this thing and but they've kind of got some success out of it. It's so again, complicated issue. So let's go back to Beyond the Sea. Again, the biggest problem now is that in the whole range of the top jobs in this movie, Kevin Spacey takes four of them. Kate Bosworth, she's really good in this film. She's like, I wasn't too fond of her in Superman Returns, but I think the chemistry between her and Spacey in this film is really good. And I really like the back and forth. Maybe that's because Kevin Spacey is a better director than Brian Singer. And that's the moment when you realize that Superman Returns has starred two people accused of molesting underage boys. Ha. Huh. Awkward. No, I literally did not write that. I only just thought about it as I was halfway through that thought. Fuck. And I like Superman Returns. I defend Superman Returns. Holy shit, I have to... <laughs> See, this is the point. It's not just a simple matter of good versus evil, morality, plays. I mean, <laughs> irony. Superman movies are morality plays, and here we are juggling with the morality of this kind of situation. So do we throw under the sea, under a bus? And you gotta remember, this is pre he made this 15 years ago. I'm not sure when the allegations with Anthony Rapp took place. I believe it was further back than that. So there's a clear potential issue here, but I can't hate this film. I, I keep mentally trying to go, I wanna be able to throw this film under the rug and say, well, it's clearly made by this terrible person. I have, to dis I have to dismiss it, but I can't. And that's one of those issues we're having to deal with now, especially in the Me Too moment. Harvey Weinstein has basically been shown to be one of the biggest scumbags on the planet, and it's tainted everything he's ever worked on. He was only a producer though, so realistically speaking, there's a lot of creative energy that he had nothing to do with in a lot of those movies, but we can't be too sure. And that's put a stain on some potentially great films. How do we go from there? Do we censor at all? Or do we acknowledge the fact that this is still something we need to consider? Is it still good on its own right? And for the most part, I'll say yes. There's probably some ultra left-wing assholes who probably want to disagree with me on that. Hey, I've already done that toxic masculinity video. Maybe it's about time for a bit of balance, but this has got nothing to do with left versus right. But a lot of people put in a lot of time and effort into these things. We're throwing under the bus, literally everyone else in the production who just wanted to make a film from the guy wrangling cables to the background extras, to the actual artists giving their craft to the screen, the actors, the occasionally the writers, some producers, not all these people are terrible. I'm, I'm betting most of these people didn't realize that Kevin Spacey had even done these things. It was kind of one of the worst kept secrets in Hollywood is uh, his orientation. A lot of LGBT people felt that they, he threw them under the bus when he confessed. People don't deserve to be thrown under the bus with him. And that's where we have to start to realize there's more to art than just the artist. There's more to a project. And we've had people that we thought were good that have in recent times kind of revealed their hand or have somehow they've changed their opinions or problem is sometimes their opinions are very static and as time has changed and the people have changed around them, they've put out to their feet on the ground and said, no, 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 you know, I'm right. I'm still right, you're wrong. Geez, uh, one famous author does come to mind. See, sometimes uh, a progressive person can stay in a rut as well. Like they may be forward thinking 20 years ago, but that forward thinking as the society has kind of come up to them has started overtaking them. And sometimes that's caused a little bit of pressure as well. These people haven't, I don't wanna say they haven't changed with the times, but that they, they've become the archaic. People who used to be forward thinking have somehow taken a step backwards. And we see this a lot with, um, I don't know if it's like second or third wave feminism. And this is one of the things that always assholes on the alt-right will always try and point to. It's like, these feminists say that 
uh, a woman with a penis is not a woman and therefore your argument is invalid because they're feminists arguing against you. And this is why we have terms like TERFs and SERFs. You're gonna probably see where I'm gonna be heading to in a tick. So there are people that at one time were considered to be great artists and probably are still considered to be great artists, but sometimes those times have changed. Do we throw that art under the bus? I mean, speaking of uh, one particular franchise who the author is kind of going a little bit, um, getting a little bit of backlash for comments being made and a lot of it feels a bit out of touch, especially from their particular roots. And it's almost like they've forgotten that they were poor once. And it's sad because you look at kind of they created and it feels like you created this really great world. People of all colors and creeds and orientations love your world. You're starting to push that away because apparently you're kind of still thinking in this outdated way or maybe your politics have changed but not for the better. And the people who used to be the people that supported you now are kind of getting a bit angry. And this leads us to the topic I actually wanted to talk about in that roundabout way. <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, uh, a YouTuber by the name of H Bomber Guy, who I would definitely recommend. He's one of my favorite uh, YouTubers. I literally rewatch all of his stuff all the time. Um, it's funny, it's irreverent, but still very relevant to kind of play up on those words. He talks about politics, he talks about video games, he talks about media. He talks about, he's a guy I kind of aspire to be. I love his humor. I think he's brilliant. And he decided to do a Donkey Kong charity screen as a big kind of F you to the original game was going to do the 101 completion. Cause yeah, Rareware is that terrible. They always add a one to the 100%. And it's a notoriously buggy and hard game. So he was gonna live stream it and he knew it was gonna take him several days. And he decided to open it up for charity. At the time when he first announced it, which was a, a few months ago, on his speedrunning video, he didn't have a particular cause in mind, so he asked people to give him recommendations. Now, during this period, another really great YouTuber and a friend of uh, H Bomber Guys, uh, Sean, of Sean and Jen, uh, did a video about uh, how transphobic the media is in England. The topic of Gray and Linham came up, and this is where it starts to get kind of hard. I'm a huge fan of Father Ted, uh, Black Books, and the IT crowd. And I've read interviews with Graham. I've listened to the audio commentaries on a lot of those DVDs, and he seems like a really good, funny, nice chap. But in the past few months, he's kind of shown his hand when it comes to trans rights, and he's basically turned into a monster. I'm not gonna go too much into that. The linchpin is that he, basically try to get a UK based charity called Mermaids defunded by the government. They get about the equivalent of about a hundred million dollars per year. I think it's about 250,000 pound per year by the uh, Lotteries Commission in the UK and Mermaids help. They help transgendered children by giving them housing, giving them resources. Uh, a lot of transgendered kids can get kicked out of their homes for just to feel right. They want to feel right in their body. Uh, Gender dysphoria is a real thing. It has been scientifically proven. I'm not gonna go into all that. So apparently my Canon camera is at both 75% battery and zero and I can't find my spare. So back to mobile. Now let's be very careful here. They don't offer medical support. They don't offer actual transitioning uh, services. They literally just help kids that are homeless. They give support, they do advocacy and they do fundraising to help trans children. Trans children have it probably, I think it's a higher chance than any other uh, like LGBT section to be kicked out of their home. For the horrendous crime of trying to fit into a body that actually aligns with who they are. Gender dysphoria is a thing. This isn't just people being trendy. There is actual science here. Not that it really cares to the turfs and people like Graham. So H Bomber Guy did a kind of fuck you to Graham Linehan and decided to do this charity stream to fundraise for mermaids. He admitted that he wasn't expecting to make that much money. He, you know, he'll get a few thousand quid. He'll done a good deed and it, it blew up. 
and he ended up raising roughly 320 to 340,000 US dollars for mermaids. <laughs> Graham didn't like that. He uh, almost infamously had a little bit of a tanty. And it seems that true colors kind of emerged over that weekend. And oh yeah, and like most turfs, he cloaks his bigotry in I'm only protecting women. He refuses to acknowledge trans people as women. He'll deliberately misgender them. He will refuse to acknowledge their personal pronouns. He has a hissy if he sees that someone has they or them or these, I must admit, I'm not particularly fond of these new pronouns, but you do you, the Zs and Zays and Zims and I don't know, please don't judge me. If you wanna be called something, that's fine, you do you. If, you, if I accidentally misgender you in conversation and you write, correct me, correct me, and I'll try my best from then on to not misgender you. That's easy. That's easy stuff to do. A lot of these turfs now, it's not what they want. They want the world to adjust to their parent. They refuse to acknowledge a lot of the science on this whilst claiming that the science is on their side. Again, watch, watch uh, H. Bond's videos. He actually, well, he actually quotes and references studies from gender identity politics on the Bill Nye videos. So this leaves us in a pretty, pretty terrible situation because as I said, I love these comedies. They are, they are fantastic. They're brilliant. And they're now forever stained because of this one loudmouth jackass who's shown his true colors. But again, we have to consider who is involved with these shows. In Father Ted, it was co-written. We know that. So we've got to kind of figure out, well, how do we judge the output between the two collaborators? We also got about the comedic actors and all that. You've got Ted, Dougal, and Jack, and the actors surrounding them. Um, the only reason why Father Ted season four basically didn't happen is because because the lead actor had suffered a heart attack after they finished wrapping the season. I, I think the series was finishing, but I believe they were going to plan a couple of specials. Uh, from what little bit of research I've done, Black Books was essentially Dylan Moran's baby. Which, if you know Moran's uh, work output in the stand-up, his fingerprints are all over this project. And you get someone like ba Bill Bailey in, and he's going to add his own... I think Graham's input into black books feels very minimal. I'm not trying that to diminish his uh, output. In retrospect, I kind of am, but we can't throw all the work of Dylan Moran, Bill Bailey, um, Tamsin, Grieg, and everyone involved with that show. We, it's, we don't want to throw them under the bus because of this asshole. Now, IT crowd gets a little bit dicier. I believe this is one of the only three where Graham is essentially credited as like the the writer but i even heard a story that he wasn't as involved in the writing as the people may play it out to be but also you look at um the actors involved in that and they all give great performances they deliver these jokes and the jokes are good i mean i think it crowds probably oh in retrospect it's only the first season that's probably brilliant i'll say the same with black books by the time the black books got to this third season it was kind of it needed to go uh it was still fun but it wasn't as punchy as that first season. And season two had some good moments. But IT Crowd, by that fourth season, it just wasn't really that good. It had lost a lot of its panache by about season three. And season four just felt like life support. And even the last episode was a bit crap. I think the roundabout way of saying this is that we have to kind of judge the art separately and still see if this is holds up. And then we can add the extra bit in. If Gray and Linehan was doing stand-up comedy and he just start throwing out all these racial epithets, then we kind of know what that is. A stand-up comedy performance is typically written by, performed by the one person. Comedy can sometimes be deliberately antagonistic and the context is usually there. We, someone's deciding to be a aggressive comic. Uh, that's a persona. It doesn't help when like Louis CK does a new set basically complaining that people got offended that he was masturbating in front of women and you know it was a clear violation of power dynamics in a business. Oh, they agree to have him masturbate in front of him. That's you know, nothing to do with the fact that they might lose their job. But there's also comedians that are deliberately trying to be offensive. Like um, Lisa Lampanelli is quite a f infamous for really pushing those boundaries. And that's what comedy should be doing. Comedy should be pushing those boundaries. But I'll probably go into this as another video. It's the concept is called punching up versus punching down. Essentially, comedy is usually better when you're punching up. You're 
fighting the authority. You're, you're giving power to the people who are powerless. Punching down is essentially you're taking the powerless and you're attacking them or you're, you're trying to use their plight as a, you know, for exploitative reasons or stuff like that. That's why, that's why Chris Rock can make an, a racist joke about black people. He's on the level and he's making commentary about his people. But Kramer saying an N-word into a crowded audience at a stand-up gig wasn't a joke. He was just basically trying to call someone out and use one of the worst words possible. And he got rightly lambasted for it. And there's people who to this day are like, oh, Kramer didn't do anything wrong. It was a joke at a comedy club. No, no, it wasn't. Nor like PewDiePie saying it on a live stream. It wasn't a joke. It was more foretelling than anything else. So we do have to judge things on the context as well. Was this a joke at someone's expense? Was this a critique? Was this satire? And satire is getting harder to deal with nowadays because people will say stupid offensive shit and go, I was just being satirical. It's parody. Parody requires context and comedy. You know, you can't be an asshole and say, oh, I did it for the lols. You weren't funny. Thanks Graham for being such an unbelievable shitbag that you caused the internet to spontaneously donate over $300,000 to a cause. If there's anything that gets ever written about that guy ever again, that should be it. Maybe we should uh, stop acknowledging his, crit uh, his creative output on those other shows and give them to the people that deserve. We also have situations where somebody who has been doing a lot of good for the community, who's been speaking up for the community, will get outright trolled by vicious assholes, basically run off segments of the internet because they all sometimes be critical of a person in power. We've seen this particularly with James Gunn where uh, admittedly he had said some really terrible things in the past, but he has also apologized for that on not only numerous occasions, because I think it was something about, he made some jokes about uh, lesbians and not finding the right guy. I think it was in context of Batwoman specifically. But he's also proven that he's not that person anymore. That was over 10 years ago. Since that time, he's been working with uh, LBGTI plus uh, advocacy and charities and stuff like that. He's proven himself to be one of those good guys. And that's the problem is that you get people who do good things and sometimes get the shit for it. Is, is that being, is that too subtle? Love you, Will. So yeah, please like, share, subscribe. I'm trying to do these more often and sometimes life gets in the way. Uh, technical dis difficulties definitely get in the way. If you have any subjects you would like me to tackle, please leave a comment. Otherwise, yeah, please share this along, spread the word, subscribe to my channel, uh, hit the bell, apparently that's a thing, and I'll hopefully talk to you soon.